Well, hey, church family, uh, it's good to be before you again today on the Lord's Day as we continue our uh, sermon series um, called Make Room, uh, Margin. We want to make room for God in our lives. And, uh, and so if you're just now joining us for this Sunday, I'd like to say welcome to our church family. Uh, we're pumped that you're here. We're glad that you're here. We would love to get to know you a little bit better. And so there's a connection card on the chair in front of you. If you'll just take a few moments and fill that out and then take it to our welcome center after service, uh, we have a teammate that'll be there uh, to connect with you and give you a gift as our way of saying thanks for being here. Um, and again, we're really glad that you're here and we would love to connect with you a little bit better. But if you'd rather connect with us digitally online, you can do that. There's a QR code on the chair in front of you. If you'll take a few moments just to scan that with your camera and then you'll uh, be directed to a digital connection card. Well, you, you'll be able to connect with us online as well. Like I said, um, my name is Rick and I preach here on Sundays, so welcome. Uh, I'm kind of nervous, but at the same time excited about this sermon because it's awkward. It makes you feel uncomfortable whenever you preach about stuff like the body or sex or controversial issues in our culture, but it's necessary because the Bible has a lot to say about sex. We all have a body. We are all wired in certain ways. We do certain things with our bodies, and our culture really uh, is, is consumed with the idea of sexuality or self-pleasure and things of that nature. So, if this is your first time here, I want to say it may get a little awkward for you this morning, hopefully not too much, but uh, we do want to talk about this and how we can make room for God to work on our lives whenever it comes to our bodies. A few weeks ago, we talked about what it looks like for God to work in our thoughts and how we need to take time to pray and meditate and fast and give God a chance to move in our, in our thoughts so that we can think about him because the mind that stays on the Lord will have perfect peace. And whenever I find myself at really um, my most difficult times, my low moments, are when I kind of feel disconnected from God, and He has not been a priority in my life. I just get too distracted with things, and I think we, we've all been there, or problems, or whatever they are. And so today, we want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. That's where we're going to be. So if you have your Bibles, whether a Bible like this or on your phone, uh, you, can, you can turn there. But I think we all have to agree that... Our culture is getting more sexual really, really quick, and it doesn't take a whole lot of time for things to change. I mean, pornography or sexuality or promiscuity is really presented before us all the time. It doesn't matter where we are or what we do or what show we watch. Um, sexuality is just there. And our children, my children, I have a five-year-old daughter, a three-year-old son, they are going to be raised in an environment where sexual things are right at their fingertips. Now, I think one of the biggest mistakes our culture makes is, especially in the church, is you can do one of two things when it comes to sexuality. You can either have the false idea that all sexuality is bad, and so therefore you, you feel a deep sense of shame and condemnation when you do anything sexual. Now, God created us. He created our bodies for sex. That's, that's how he designed a part of our anatomy, was to experience this oneness and this intimacy with another person of the opposite sex. That's, that's how we're designed. So you could walk away feeling a deep sense of shame because you, were, grew, you grew up believing that sex was wrong. On the other hand, you can have the other false idea that all sexual desire is good. And so anything that you feel or anything that you want or anything that you're attracted to or attracted to do... All of those things are good, and so if you just follow your desire or your passion, therefore, you know, you can live the life that you want to live, and that's equally a false idea. We want the biblical narrative, because as Christians, we believe that God exists, and Christianity is true, and Jesus resurrected from the dead, and what the Bible has to say about certain subjects is true, and so that's, that's where we want to position ourselves. But like I said, our, our kids are really growing up in an overly sexualized culture to where sex is now the measuring stick for success in life, happiness in a relationship. I mean, they literally, our culture literally says that you need to experience sex with another person before you can decide whether or not you have compatibility and you'll be happy. And that, my friends, is how we have got to the point where we are least happy than we've ever been. Relationships break up more often than they ever have. And this isn't just a problem in the world. This isn't just a complication in the world. It's also a complication in the church. 
Over the last year, you know, I, I'm online and I follow things that are online. And for instance, if you look at what California is doing to uh, sex education in children, they are literally teaching five-year-olds all the way up to 12th, 12th grade how to pleasure themselves through, through self-pleasure. That is a, becoming a part of their curriculum. They feel as if they need to teach and educate children uh, who have these things in their, in their bodies, you know, that they don't really know about or are, are totally aware of, but they are actually educating kids on sexual self-pleasure. It is, it is a travesty. That should take place in the home. That should take place with the governance of God's Word and parents educating their kids, but this is what is coming down the pipe. Ten years ago, if we were to say that this is what is going to happen to our kids, you would have looked at the guy or girl saying it and saying, you're insane. You're crazy. This will never happen. But things are escalating quicker and quicker and faster and more extreme. And this is the culture in which we find ourselves. But it is wrong to try to avoid the subject. That is an extreme error. That was something that my parents kind of did because, let's face it, it's probably really awkward to talk to your kids about sex, about, about the body. And so I was left to kind of figure it out on my own. I didn't have people in my life that could guide and guard and govern me through this complicated issue of our bodies. And it's not just sex. It's food. It's other types of self-pleasure. I mean, this body that we have given, uh, been given to by God is something that we need to have good stewardship on. And so we're going to try to deal with this really awkward issue in the best way possible. And I think if we can get to the virtue, if we can make room for God to work in our bodies, if we can glorify God with our bodies, we will find that other things in our life, whether it's our dieting and our eating, or whether it's sex, or other forms of self-pleasure when it comes to our body, like exercise, I think we'll get it right if we can deal with the virtue. And so that's what I'm going to try to attempt to deal with this morning through this passage. I recently read a post um, by a woman named Flora Gill. Uh, it was circulating on the internet, and I couldn't believe what I saw. And here's, here's what she wrote. This is how bad our culture is getting, but it's only a matter of time before this is actually what takes place. Here's what she wrote. Someone needs to create porn for children. Hear me out. Young teens are already watching porn, but they're finding hardcore, aggressive videos that give a terrible view of sex. They need entry-level porn, a softcore site where everyone asks for consent and no one gets choked. Porn for children. Now, we may scoff at that and shake our heads at that and say, that's insane. But look, there are things happening now that 10 years ago we thought not a chance of happening. This is insane. There's no way our culture will agree with this type of idea. But unfortunately, this is the way our culture is headed. And you know how I know that? Because history repeats itself. I mean, if you were to go to the church at Corinth, for instance, 2,000 years ago, they were immersed in an overly sexualized culture. They had an entire temple dedicated to sexual immorality, where people would go in and worship the goddess Diana, and they would have sex with temple prostitutes as an act of worship. They would pleasure themselves out in public. I mean, you want to talk about an overly sexualized culture. Well, this was it. Now, you had to walk down the street in order to get it, but it was overly obvious. It was right there in front of their face. Well, now we have it at our fingertips with digital technology. And our culture, even right here in the state of Maryland, we are experiencing this very same thing. And I've talked about different things before, how our society is becoming obsessed with sexuality, and sexuality is a good thing, but it has boundaries. It has a certain biblical perspective that I think we should all follow, and not just for biblical reasons, but even physiological reasons, sociological reasons. I think the biblical view is not just the best because it's the Bible. I think it's the best because it produces the best kind of culture for us to grow up in. You know, over 14,000 sexual references are made on TV each year. 14,000. It's probably increased because these are kind of old numbers. The average person will view over 100,000 of sexual references in his or her lifetime. It's a constant information flow of sexuality. The more sexuality there is, the higher the ratings. That's why people like to watch those kind of TV shows. And we are becoming so desensitized in our culture to sexuality that those who advertise to us have to continue to, to raise the bar and become more extreme. And so the cycle rinses and repeats it. And as a church culture, we really can't point the finger. Because I don't know about any other man in this church, but I've struggled with sexual things. I still do today. You know, if we kicked out everybody in the church that struggled with sexual sin, I'd probably be the only one left. That's a joke. 
I'm a raging heterosexual. I mean, I, I, I go outside of God's intended boundaries in my mind all the time, and that's not how it should be. That's not what I want to strive for as a Christian. But let's, let's own this. Let's have extreme ownership and face up to the fact that if we want to become the person that we talked about over seven weeks through our sermon series called DNA, we have to confront and face some of these issues that we all battle, both man and woman. And it's something worth talking about. And so the church and our culture errs in one of two different ways. The first one is this, assuming all sexual desire is good. And the second error is this, believing all sexual desire is evil. And we don't want either one of those two extremes. And you know, I love the idea of freedom. There's this big cultural pop phrase right now. I love the idea of freedom and sexual freedom and sexual choice. And I believe that that is true, but it depends on what you mean by what you're saying. We were created for freedom. In fact, Christ died to make us free. It says that in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. Freedom is a beautiful idea. It's a biblical concept. It's something that we should all hold near and dear. There should be no one that should force me to have sex with somebody that I don't want to. There should be no one that forces me to marry somebody that I don't want to marry and commit myself to. I should have the freedom to choose whichever partner I want to choose and to have sex with whoever I want to within the boundaries of God's limitations. That is true biblical freedom. But what Satan does is he comes along and he twists the idea of freedom. Freedom to mean you can go out and do anything that you want to do. As long as it feels good, do it. And that's a cultural lie. You see, freedom itself is a cherished value that we should defend at all costs, just like Jesus did on the cross, while at the same time, biblical freedom falls within the boundary of the great commandment, loving God, loving others, and loving self. And if we love, in the sense of the New Testament uh, that it teaches, we need no other guide other than biblical love. That will give us the greatest sexual ethic that we could ever have as a culture, as a church, as a community, is biblical love. That is our great guide. Paul put it like this in Romans chapter 13, verse 8. He says, love is the fulfillment of the law. I don't need a lot of rules and regulations. I'm set free from that. But love guides me to say, Am, whatever I'm going to do with my body, whether it's sexually or with food or exercise or materialism, does it love God? Does it love others? And does it love myself? And so true freedom will not violate this governing ethic of loving God, loving others, and loving self. But that's exactly what the church at Corinth finds themselves in conflict with. They are not loving God. They are not loving others, and they are not loving self. And we're going to see uh, what happens here in a few moments. And so what Paul's going to do in this passage of Scripture is he's going to assume a literary device called diatribe. It's where you picture this imaginary opponent, and that imaginary opponent will say something, and then you will respond to that. And Paul's going to use that dialogue to bring home probably one of the most powerful points that we could walk away with this morning. And in general, our idea of sexual ethics, and that's this, to glorify God in our temples. That's the goal, to bring God glory through our temples. And whatever we do with our bodies, it's to bring him glory. And so Paul's going to use this imaginary opponent, and then he's going to provide a response. Look what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. He's talking about freedom and mastery here, and here's what he says. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. We see this cultural doctrine, this philosophy of my body, my choice, bodily freedom. I should be able to do whatever I want to do and not be restricted by anyone. But even those who propagate this proposition will say as long, they will provide a, a parameter, a clarification, as long as what? It doesn't hurt somebody. I should be able to do whatever it is that I want with my body as long as it doesn't hurt someone. Now, as a Christian, I escalate that a little higher according to the words of the Apostle Paul, as we'll see in this passage. It's not just about I can do whatever I do, want to do as long as I don't hurt other people, but it's what does it mean to love God through what I'm going to do? What does it mean to love other people through what I'm going to do? And what does it mean to love myself through what I'm going to do? The greatest commandment that we can follow. And where the church at Corinth and perhaps even ourselves have gone astray is our understanding of freedom, is that they came to the conclusion that sexual freedom or biblical freedom means I can do whatever I want. And that's absolutely not the case. Author Leon Morris writes this, the Corinthians were taken Christian liberty to mean 
Not an unbounded opportunity to show the scope of love, but an incredible means of gratifying their own desires. You see, it was for freedom that Christ set you free so that you could demonstrate how wonderful and how wide and how great the love of God is. Not so that we can say, what is the most that will gratify me and that's what I want to do. If you've been a Christian for any amount of time and you've been married, you will come to find out that often sex is not about your own personal gratification, but it's an action of love towards the other person. It's what will make them feel uh, good. It's what will bring them pleasure. It's not just about my selfish wants and my gratification and my need. Really, sex, sex and marriage is about selflessness and loving the other person to meet their needs, and then you enter that reciprocal relationship. But what our culture has done and what even our own minds have done is we redefine sexual freedom to be anything that we want to do, and that's simply not the case. Paul puts it like this, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial or helpful. Beneficial or helpful literally means this. It's ethics that are helpful for the common good. It's actions that do not exploit other people. That's what it means to be beneficial or helpful. The word help or helpful is the same word used to describe Eve when she was created for Adam in this beautiful story, this picture of God creating humankind, and he creates the universe, and then he finds that Adam has no suitable helper for him, and so he creates Eve as a helper for Adam, not for them to exploit one another or take advantage of one another. It's not that Eve was created to satisfy Adam's sexual desires. It's that they were created for commonality and unity, to help one another, to give and to love one another, to not exploit. And so this idea of being helpful, helpful answers the question, is it good for them? Whereas our culture says, is it good for me? You see, liberty that exploits oneself or others isn't loving and therefore should be avoided. And so if we can have this biblical idea of sexual ethic, we can not only glorify God in our bodies, but we can live an even better life. People who have more sex with more people are less satisfied sexually. It's in the research. It's in the statistics. You will feel more empty. You will feel less compatibility. And there is unspoken damage that takes place in casual sexual culture. It's just the facts. It's not only a biblical narrative, but it's what we find when we look at research into the world. You know, biblical freedom, it places this boundary, not only of this ethic of, is it good for other people, and does it not exploit other people, but it also places this parameter, this boundary on self-mastery. Are you free if you're enslaved to things like a food addiction, or substance abuse, or sex addiction, you see, in the name of sexual freedom, or in the name of freedom at all, we actually become a slave because now we're enslaved to the very thing that we say is our sexual freedom of choice. And so Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. I appreciated what author uh, Thomas Charles Edwards wrote in his commentary. He says, all things are in my power, but I shall not be overpowered by anything. And if there's one thing that our culture is overpowered by, it's sex. It's sexuality. There's a, an overload. It's overkill. It's, it's, you are enslaved to this idea of self-pleasure and sex. And so liberty, uh, which became a means of experiencing life to the maximum, has now become this method by which we enslave ourselves because we have the wrong idea of freedom and we have the wrong idea of sex. You see, liberty which became slavery was not love, but actually self-hatred. I mean, think about this, guys. After you viewed porn, do you feel more free? No. You feel awful. You feel dirty. You question whether or not God could continue to love you through this weakness. When, friends, if you overeat, then you overindulge. You're like, man, I feel great after I just punished my body. No. You feel terrible. You feel enslaved that I can't even control the food that goes in, uh, in my mouth. I, I, am, I am weak. I'm, I'm failing. I'm messing up. It's, it's a trap. It's enslavement. It's a form of self-hatred. And our governing ethic to love God and love people, our governing ethic to glorify God in our bodies is does it love God, does it love others, and does it love self? You see, to be enslaved by anything, it's like a public baptism. We just had a baptism into Christ. This is my Lord, 
That's the thing that governs your life. That's the thing that rules your life. And if that is food or sex or substance abuse, that is like a public baptism into an unlawful Lord over your body. You see, in asserting Christian freedom, we may find ourselves in bondage to the very things we do by way of asserting our freedom. And so if we are addicted to alcohol or other substances, are we really free? No, we're not free. That thing is our master. That thing controls our day, what we do, when we do it. It now becomes our Lord. Are we free if we are controlled by sexuality? If we are incapable of mastering our mind and our thoughts, well, no. We have now become enslaved that that becomes the dictation for what we do. I was listening to a famous Navy SEAL, and uh, he put it in coarse language that I'm going to filter for you this morning. But he basically says this, if you can't control your brain, you're screwed. He used different words. If you can't control your brain, if you can't tell your body what it is, it is going to do, you won't be successful. There's no way you can achieve your goals. It's by putting your mind into subjection. It's by controlling your thoughts and your desires and what is carried out through your body do you find true freedom. Jocko Willink puts it like this, true freedom is found in discipline. And these guys have been through some of the most excruciating training that you could ever experience in your lifetime. And these are guys who have been on the other side and look back and said, this is how you get true freedom. It's through discipline and self-control. And man, I love listening to stuff like that because I have to be honest with you. There are many times where I'm not disciplined. There are many times where I lack self-control. And I've been so convicted this year, I told my wife this. I said, this year, now that I've completed my master's degree, I really want to focus in on my health. I want to become the master of Rick Bonifield and who I am. I don't want to be controlled by other things, by food and desires, because that shows up in a pattern for my life. And here's the other thing. Our bodies are closely connected with our spirits. Everything is connected together. When I am tired or depressed or worn out, that has a great effect on my spirit and my relationship with God, and vice versa. When I'm disconnected from God and I'm not following after him, it directly affects my body and how I'm feeling. Everything is interconnected. We cannot have the spiritual life that we've dreamed of disconnected from our body. It is absolutely impossible. And that's what Paul is telling us. And so we are not free if we have a master other than Jesus. And so the key question is this. Am I unwittingly submitting my body to the lordship of a passion or an addiction? I'm not meaning to. I'm not doing this on purpose. But have I unwittingly submitted myself to something like a food passion or a sex passion or a lust or a substance abuse or a state of mind and a philosophy? You know, if you, if you wake up every day looking in the mirror and saying, you're a loser, you're worthless, you will actually look at the world through that coaching, through that self-discovery. If you view yourself and you're stuck in the enslavement of a negative perspective on your life, everything in your life, the people that love you, your job performance, the world around you, your relationship with your kids, your church family, everything will be filtered through that mindset, that coaching. I don't have any value and I'm worthless. And so we have to change our minds. We have to glorify God in our bodies. And it's not just with our body parts, but it's also every part of our body, what we think about ourselves, how we feed ourselves, and how we treat ourselves. And like I said, it's very uncomfortable because I'm a hypocrite. I struggle with all of these things. But I'm not saying that I don't struggle with them, so maybe I don't fit the biblical definition of a hypocrite. I'm just simply trying to expose something that I think is real and true for all of us and highly uncomfortable because it's something I think we all struggle and deal with. And so... True biblical freedom is submitting ourselves to Jesus. Look what Paul goes on to say in verse 13. He says, here's, here's the argument maybe. How about this, okay? So the, the Corinthians, the Greeks say, hey, look, everything's lawful for me. I can do whatever I want to do. And Paul says, ah, that might be true. Everything is lawful, but not everything is beneficial. Not everything is good. Just because you can do it doesn't mean it should be done, number one. And number two, to be mastered by something that you claim is lawful is actually to live in slavery, and so they respond with this, well, hey, how about this? Well, food is meant for the stomach, and stomach is meant for the food. In other words, it feels good, do it. I mean, after all, this is how we were designed. 
And so what would happen is they would have these pagan feasts in Greek culture, and they would overindulge themselves. They would worship the god Bacchus, who's the god of wine. They would glutton themselves. They would throw up, and then they would eat more food. They would have pagan and idol worship where they would have sex with temple prostitutes, and they would just throw this huge kind of orgy-like party, and that's how they would celebrate in their, in their pagan festival and feasts, in the worship of other gods. And so they came away with this idea, and this was from Greek philosophy. If it feels natural, just do it. Fornication, for instance, is a natural act just like eating. I mean, our bodies are designed for sex. Sex for the body, body for sex. And so if the stomach was made for food and food for the stomach, what about other things like sex? How would you respond to that kind of argument? You see, Plato, actually, he argued that senses could and should be indulged now because you can't indulge them in the afterlife. And so indulge them as much as possible and enjoy them, for the most part, as much as possible within their moral framework. Well, that's false, and we're going to see how Paul responds to this. Here's what Paul says. Yeah, and God will destroy both. He'll destroy both of them. But the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. So here's the breakdown in the argument, he says. Food is made for the stomach, and the stomach is made for food. But both aren't going to last forever, but your body will. And your body wasn't designed for fornication. It wasn't designed for sexual immorality. In other words, Paul appeals to a design argument. That's not God's original design. Jesus did the same thing. This is how God designed marriage to work. This is, this is how he set up things to work. He says, God will destroy both. This word destroy means to nullify. It's the same word that Paul used in 1 Corinthians 1.28. It means to render idle or inoperative. It means it's just not going to work out in, in, in eternity. But your bodies, your bodies aren't going to be destroyed. They're going to be resurrected. They're going to be made new. You are going to live forever with the Lord in a bodily resurrection. You're not going to be some f spirit floating off in space, Paul says. And so here's how he responds to the argument. Yes, the stomach and food are temporary, but they're transient, and they carry out a temporary purpose of growing and sustaining the body. But what is the body designed for? Well, it's not sexual morality. The body is designed to honor God. That's, that's what it's designed for, to honor God. And so Paul makes this argument that while we have the ability to do such things, certain things in life were simply not designed to operate that way. Your body was not designed to take on certain sexual acts. It is actually harmful and self-destructive for the body. People that do not, for instance, practice heterosexual sex, people that are homosexuals or lesbians, their lifespan is lower than the average heterosexual. The body wasn't designed to experience certain types of sexual pleasure. That's just not how God made things. It's destructive for the body. It breaks down the body. It's not what God meant for us. While at the same time, having many sexual partners is equally not how the body is designed. People that are raging heterosexuals, for instance, that have sex outside of marriage over and over again, their quality of life and their lifespan is also lesser than those who practice sex within the beautiful confinements of marriage that God created for us. It's not just the Bible, guys. It's science. It's research. It's statistics. All you have to do is just go look it up. Check it out for yourself. It's there. And that's the same argument that Paul was using. This isn't how we were designed. You see, Paul further uh, declares that Greek philosophy, he says it's actually false. Because not only do you actually carry on your physical bodies in the afterlife, but you will actually do things to honor and glorify God in the afterlife. We will work. We will play. We will explore. Maybe we won't eat. Maybe it'll be a different kind of food. I don't know. We definitely know that there's no marriage or union in heaven. Um, sexual reproduction is not something that we'll experience in the afterlife. But our bodies do have a greater purpose than this life. Commentator Garland writes this. He says, look, here's what Paul was saying. They should live in ways congruent with who they are. And we as a Christian, it's almost impossible to take this ethic and apply it to the world. I mean, seriously, right? People that don't believe that Jesus is real or that the Bible is true or that God exists are not going to succumb to this sexual ethic that we are teaching this morning. And there's nothing that we can do about that. But we as Christians, we can influence our families and our schools and our communities and ourselves with what the Bible teaches us. Because here's the deal. Our temples are sacred to God. He created us for a purpose. 
And if we want to be the best version of ourselves, we have to make room for God to move in our temples. And the only way that we can do that is to live according to, de- to the design that he made for our bodies. Our bodies, for instance, were not made to gluttonize ourselves with food, to punish ourselves physically, to where we shut down our body with food. That's not our purpose. Food was made to fuel the body. We were made to live, not made to eat. Eating is a part of living. It's not living itself. But I'll be the first one to admit, man, I have been there, and at times I am still there. I am in a fight for physical health. But I want to honor and glorify God with my body. Not only does Paul appeal to how our bodies are designed, but he also appeals to the authority of Genesis 2. Look what he goes on to say in verse 15 and 16. He says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members with a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. So maybe we're tempted in the church to say, hey, look, if my love doesn't hurt you, why do you care? Why should you have any say over my body and my choice? In fact, you're oppressing me in the name of purity. I don't want your Christian ethic. And that may be true for people in the world. There's nothing that we can do about that. But if we're willing to submit to the authority of Christ, Paul says, it's bigger than that. Our bodies don't belong to us. It's not my body, my choice as a Christian. This is the body that Jesus gave for me. As we'll see, this is the body that Jesus died for me, to redeem it so that I can live forever with him. He says in verse 16, your bodies, when you have sex with another person, are united with them. Now, if God exists and Christianity is true and Jesus resurrected from the dead and the Bible is trustworthy and we could accept it as a reliable, true document that does not have error, what Paul is saying here is that you have a close bond with another person when you have sex with them. It's not just a physical bond that takes place. There is a metaphysical union that occurs. It's the word they used for glue. Think about that imagery in your mind. It's the same word that they use in this culture for glue when you have sex with another person. You are joining and gluing yourselves to them, not just physically, but also spiritually. Casual sex is anything but casual. Casual sex is not casual sex. And Paul is saying, look, there is a, there's a danger here. Here's the warning. Joining your physical body with a prostitute, knowing about the unity of sex, takes the member of Christ and joins it to another entity. That's what Paul is saying. There are direct consequences to our faith through sexual immorality. And some of these prostitutes were directly connected with the goddess of Diana at the temple of Corinth. And to have sex with that temple prostitute is to engage in idol worship. And look, we don't worship the goddess of Diana today. That's not a popular god that we worship. We worship the god of self. And so what we're saying through the means of self-pleasure, if self-pleasure is our governing ethic, what we are declaring is that self-pleasure is the Lord over my life, and that's what I worship. That's what I follow. That's what governs my work ethic, my lifestyle, my family, is what brings me the most pleasure. And that doesn't follow the greatest command. Does it love God? Does it love others? And does it love self? You see, this oneness that takes place between two people, it's this physical oneness that represents a metaphysical oneness, which is a picture of our relationship with Jesus. And this is how he puts it in verse 17. He says, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. He plays on this Old Testament imagery where the Old Testament uh, Israel was pictured as married to God. God was their husband, and they were God's wife, and they had a covenant relationship that was consummated through faith, and that's the exact same picture of us and Jesus. And here's the problem, okay? Here's the issue, is that an evil or a worldly sexuality defiles the sanctity of our bodies and our relationship with Jesus. That's what it does, It turns something beautiful that Jesus died for, and it makes it no longer sacred. And our bodies are sacred. They have value. It's not like the animal kingdom. We are created in the image of God, and we are called to glorify him with our bodies. And it's not just sex, but we could extend this principle to food or over-exercising our bodies. Whatever it is, we can go outside of the boundaries that God has set for us. And here's how we're going to end this morning, and here's how Paul ends this passage. Therefore, here's what he wants you to do, okay? Here's what Paul is asking us to do this morning. Flee sexual immorality. 
Every other sin a person commits, he says, is outside of the body. But, sexual, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. And then he says this, Or do you not know that your body is a temple? It's a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. When he was baptized into Christ, in that moment, the Bible says, God's Spirit began to dwell inside of him. And that's what Paul's teaching us. It's not just how we were designed and created to be. It's not just about loving God and loving others and loving self. But we become one in spirit with Jesus. He lives inside. I don't know how. All right, it's this spiritual, metaphysical dwelling. But he lives right here inside of me. And when I join that through sexual immorality, he says this. You are not your own. So when I join God, I'm not my own, but when I join God to sexual morality, I am joining Jesus to sexual morality. That's the consequence. He says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, whom God, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You were ransomed. It's this word used for the exchanging of a slave that was set free. Money was paid for you. God bought you back. You are his. Therefore, Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Flee. That's what I'm asking you to do this week. Flee in your thoughts. Flee in your temptations. If you have the natural inclination, for instance, of sexual attraction, that's normal. That's not evil. That's not wrong. Wow, look at her. She's beautiful. Wow, look at him. He's handsome. That's fine. But when you start to play that movie in your mind, run from it. Think about other things. Quote scripture, sing praise songs, have a conversation, run from those thoughts. It's like, do you remember Joseph and Potiphar's wife? When Potiphar came in in the Old Testament, Potiphar, uh, in the book of Genesis, uh, Potiphar's wife came in and she tried to seduce um, Joseph into a sexual adulterous relationship with her. He didn't stand to argue. He didn't try to fight it. He didn't say, I'm going to wrestle against this thing. He ran. He got out of there. That's exactly what Paul's encouraging us to do when it comes to sexual sin. And here's what I'm saying. I think, I think adultery and fornication and sex outside of, of, of marriage and sex outside of God's design are really, are really a symptom of the bigger problem. Here's what I'm asking. I'm not asking you necessarily to run from sex. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying run from the world's view of sex to the biblical view of sex. Run from the manipulated view of sex to Jesus' view of sex. Run from the cultural definition of sex to God's design and intention for sex. That's what Paul's calling us to do. And we need to run from the real problem, not the symptoms of the problem. And here's the real problem. The real problem is this, epithumia. It's the Greek word for lust. And a lot of people get this confused because they think lust is mere sexual attraction. And so I've got to run from sexual attraction altogether. And that's not what the Bible is teaching. You were designed and created for sex. It is natural to view other people as beautiful. What epithumia is, okay, is what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 27. Here's what he says. You have heard that it was said you should not commit adultery. But I say unto you that everyone who looks at a woman or man with lust, with lustful intent, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body to be thrown in hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body to be thrown into hell. He says to actually lust after another person is to engage in the eyes of God in adultery as a married man or fornication as an unmarried person. And Paul says, run from epithumia. Here's what it is. It's not referring to ordinary sexual attraction, but to intentionally objectifying another person for one's own selfish gratification. I put it like this, okay? Epithumia is like this. You see a movie, you see an advertisement, you see a beautiful person. It's a beautiful person, you're attracted. And then the movie starts to play in your mind where you objectify that person and you fantasize and you don't push stop and run from that thought. That is epithumia. We are not called to be sexless people. We are called to have purity in sex. James Bryant Smith puts it like this. Epithumia is not referring to the first look, but the second. The first look may be simple attraction, but the second look is leering. Lust does not value the person, but mere body parts. That's what we're called to run from. And I think if we could just start there, a technique like bouncing the eyes. You see somebody that's beautiful? 
Sexual attraction happens, and then you bounce the eyes. You don't allow yourself to stare and gaze and role play with that person in your mind. There is a clear difference between sexual attraction and objectifying another person, between feeling sexual desire and then cultivating it for personal gratification. Objectification says fulfilling my desire is the most important thing. It's more important than fulfilling my own commitment. And here's the deal. Through lust, we toss the value of the other person aside. To glorify God in our temples is to run from epithumia. It's to flee sexual immorality. It's to say, God, you design my body. You give me the liberty to do whatever I want with my body. But it might not be helpful. It might not be beneficial. It might not follow the ethic of selflessness and loving God, and loving others, and loving other people. It's not how you designed me to operate. And even though it's natural, you've created me for a purpose within that natural fit. To run from epithumia is to run from a life of saying, it's all about me and not about Jesus. Remember, Paul says, you were bought. Your temple was bought with a price. He purchased you. And so we as Christians, when we make Jesus Lord over our life, we are called to respond to glorify God with our temples. And here's, here's the best way that I can put it, and this is how I'm going to end uh, this sermon with a story, is that we were meant to house the fullness of God. He comes to live inside of us, and we are called to glorify God with our bodies, to glorify him with our hearts, our souls, our minds, and our strength. And we were meant to house the fullness of God, to live the life that he called us to live in the first place. I read a story about John of Krasendalt. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. It's some Russian town. But he was a 19th century Russian Orthodox priest when alcohol abuse was rampant. Everybody was getting drunk. None of the priests ventured out into the streets and to the churches outside of their own four walls to really help people. And they waited for people to come into their cathedrals and then they would render aid or help them with spiritual guidance. But here's what John did. Compelled with love, he went out into the streets and people were hung over, they were covered in vomit and urine, they smelled, I mean, just unbelievably bad. They'd be laying down in the gutter of the street, and John would go up, and he would pick them up, and he would cradle them, and here's what he would say to them. He would tell them, this is beneath your dignity. You were meant for the fullness of God. And I think that's exactly how Jesus pictures us. When we fall into the temptations of sin, when we overeat, when we struggle with sexual impurity, whether it's looking at pornography or committing adultery or fornication and uh, whatever it is that we do to our bodies outside of God's intention, I think Jesus is not just going, there you go, messing up again, you worthless piece of trash. Oh, no. I think God is willing to come to us and hold us and say, you were meant to house the fullness of God. You were created to be more than this. You can live differently. And it is that love that can change us. It's that forgiveness that can change us. And so don't leave this morning feeling dirty and wrong and worthless and like God doesn't love you. Leave this morning knowing this. No matter what you've done, I don't care what it is with your body. No matter what you thought even during this sermon, Jesus paid the price for you and you can live with the fullness of God. You can press restart right this very moment and you could run from sexual morality into the arms of Jesus. And he'll love you all the same. And so we're going to take a few moments to remember that love. If you haven't had the opportunity, I want to encourage you to grab a travel communion in the basket at the back of the auditorium. And we're reminded through the Lord's Supper that Jesus died for us. He forgave us of all of our sin. Not just the ones the church culture maybe like to pick and choose, but all of it. I've sinned sexually before. I've overeaten and punished my body before. I've taken substances that I shouldn't have taken before. I mean, I've probably committed every sin that you could ever possibly commit. And yet Jesus loves me. He not only loves me through it, he loves me to him. And so he sat with his disciples and he wanted to remind them, these, these 12 men, they had broken past. They weren't perfect. They were dirty, stinky, smelly, broken men, just like me. And he passed this bread and this cup around, and they broke it. And he says, I want you to take this, and here's what I want you to remember. Not your sin, but the forgiveness of your sin. I died for you. My blood was shed for you. And you can live a life far beyond that you've ever imagined. You can become 
the person that God created you to be. And that's what we remember on the Lord's Day. That's why we gather together to love Jesus back for what he did for us. And so as you take the Lord's Supper, don't remember where you've messed up. Remember the cross and where Jesus went right for you. And if you've struggled sexually before, if you've made mistakes, you're in good company. We're broken people trying to love God and love others and love ourselves. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for your truth and your word, and it makes me uncomfortable, and I'm sure it's made all of us uncomfortable this morning, but God, we're here to declare your word and make room for you to work in our lives, and God, we can't glorify you in our bodies if we're so preoccupied with epithumia, with lusts and passions and being enslaved to these things that control us and dictate our lives. Lord, we come to the Lord's table right now, and we ask uh, that you love us through our weaknesses and that you give us the moral strength to overcome them. Lord, we, we think about Jesus and we remember what he did for us on the cross and how he died for us so that we would not live a life enslaved to these sins, but that we could be set free and that we could love you the way you created us to be. Lord, I know I've made mistakes and I've messed up. And God, I remember your forgiveness and your freedom that you've given to me and you've given to us as Christians. And we're no better than anybody else out in the world. We just are trying to choose to be different. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. And Lord, we pray for this week that we could press reset and live for you differently and new. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.